What are you hoping to get out of today's walk? First of all, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of quite happy to be out the office, especially with everybody working from home at the minute. It can be a bit, um, be a bit tough, so it's nice to be mm. out in the fresh air, even though that the rain and the weather's pretty rubbish. But for me, we've had a lot of rain recently. The river's changed. You can see straight away mm. that the river's in flood, um, which is a lot different to what we saw in the summer when we had a lot of dry weather. Um, so I just sort of want to take in how the river's changed over such a short period of time, especially as the seasons change from summer to autumn now. Um, and also, I'm a scientist, um, so I deal with numbers and facts and figures. I'd love to see what your perspective is on the river from an artist's perspective and see what I can learn from your observation of the environment. Brilliant. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Um, well, I mean, I live near this river, but when I live next to it, it's, it's not quite that small, but it's smaller, a lot smaller. Um, and where I live, it's flooded as well and it's gone out into the field. So it's really interesting to see the effect of that further downstream. And similar to you, I'm quite interested in how we, we sort of focus on similar subject matter, but we come at it from quite different directions. So I've got some materials I brought with me that I'd like to map, if you like, our experiences of the river today, because I'm quite interested in people's embodied and sensory experiences of a place and what that can tell us. So if we take that map away and look at it and think about it, what do we learn from our own direct experience of the river? Okay, that sounds perfect because I love making maps and I make maps for my job but I make maps of the past and landscapes in the past so it's quite refreshing for me to now be able to stand in a landscape and see the landscape and create a map of that whereas usually I'm looking at little pockets of information that we've dug up from the ground and um, often that has archaeology associated with it so it'll be a quite a nice change for me. Excellent and I, I think it's fascinating because if you like you're mapping the past I'm, I'm very much about mapping as you go along, so mapping in the current moment. And then we're both interested in how that informs what's going to happen in the future in terms of how our river's going to change, how is the sea going to change, you know, with sea level rises and climate and so on, so. Exactly. And I think you just mentioned sea level rise and you also mentioned about you live further upstream from this. It's that understanding that rivers are sort of conduits in the landscape. They connect the middle of the land to the sea and the minute any side of that changes, for example if sea level rises, that change propagates all the way up through the river and there is a landscape response to that. And we see that in the past because we know sea levels did rise in mm. the past and we reconstruct those rising sea levels and we see how a river changes and obviously the minute a river changes the people living around that river change as well. So that's quite interesting. So, this is what I brought along for us to use today. There's one for you. Um, when I'm going on a walk, like on a river or along a river, what I tend to do is record my experience in different ways. So it might be that I'm recording using sound and video, or it might be more writing sometimes, it might be more drawing sometimes. But I thought as we're both quite interested in mapping, um, then I start off with something that had a similar format to a map. So this is like a fold-out map or a concertina sketchbook. Um, I think one of the reasons I started doing these actually was I saw a really nice map of the Mississippi and how it had changed over time and they sort of had overlaid paths in different colours going all the way down a really long roll-out map and that was lovely so I started doing similar kind of format maps along my own local river. So it's completely for you to use however you want to mm -hmm. but there's for instance there's crayons in here so we can do some rubbings yeah whether that's of trees or of more urban features when we get further along. Um, there's stuff to write with, stuff to draw with, but obviously it's completely open to you how you use that. That's great, thank you. You're very welcome. I mean, but immediately I'm thinking, you know, we've got, it's a windy day and like you mentioned just now, the reeds are making quite an amazing sound. The willow trees made a slightly different sound, so I'd quite often be writing those things down as well. So it's a real sort of layering of writing, drawing, rubbings, all different things. So your whole sort of multi-sensory experience coming together in one place. Not just the visual, it's taking the whole environment in. Yeah, your top soil is just where your grass is growing, so that's your organic material. But what's beneath it is the river um, sediment or deposit, we call it. We don't want to call it soil because soil usually means yeah. organic. Yeah. But it's, um, it's material, sand, gravel, silt, clay that's been picked up by the river and then laid down by the river. Yeah, because it's weird because it looks quite clay but it feels very grainy. Yep, so there's a bit of sand in there, that'll be the danger feeling. Lots of flint because we're on the It'd be nice to get a little bit, of, a bit of the grass as well. Green rather. Oh, it's a bit wet. 
It's nice to get started, isn't it? Yeah. Rather than have just white paper. Well, if this is a perfect example, I can round them off. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to see, uh, you, you can basically teach me as we go and by the end I'll have some sort of lovely well, observation. I just, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in seeing what you do rather than sort of informing what you do, if you yeah, know what I mean. Or they'll, they'll inter, you know, whatever Don't the word die. is. Don't let me be a free spirit. Right. <laughs> <laughs> <sighs> you know this is either badges at work or something. Um, yeah, no, we just sort of noticed um, these structures that are here in the river, they are on the margin of the river um, where it's quite shallow, and the man-made structures, people have put these in to somehow try and modify the riverbank, and I think what they're trying to do is they're trying to stop the river from eating away into the bank and eroding it and getting wider. So what they've done is they've put some wooden logs in, and they're trying to interrupt the current. So rivers have natural currents and those currents pick up sand, gravel, mud and transport them downstream. By putting a structure in, you're basically creating something that's gonna disturb the current. So you're disturbing where a river will lay down sand and gravel. So by putting these structures here, they're almost trying to trap sediment mm -hmm. or sand and gravel. Um, and, and I imagine uh, all the people and the dogs going in this part as well, yeah. trying to stop people eroding it from the bank downwards. That is a very good point, because um, yeah, this is a place where people come to swim, dogs come to swim and things, so people are disturbing the river by sort of causing erosion, you can mm -hmm. see around me. We've got no vegetation, we've just got gravel um, and mud. So vegetation acts as, um, it stabilises a river bank, so the minute you remove that vegetation with people walking over it, you remove that stabilisation mm. and the river will start to yeah. erode. So I think it's a, this is possibly why they've put these structures in here to try and protect this part of the river and stop it eating away into the landscape behind us. So yeah, people get involved and mess about with nature all the time. For good, but sometimes for bad. But then, yeah, see, I'm really interested in that as well, because this whole human nature split, I mean, we are nature, basically, aren't we? We are now, yes. So. But luckily, when, because I'm an archaeologist and I look into the past, I yeah. work in the prehistoric period, yeah. people will have had an impact on the landscape, but we weren't farming, there wasn't intensive agriculture, there mm. wasn't huge buildings, roads, yeah. cars. Yeah. So nature in prehistoric times was allowed to do what it wanted to do without mm -hmm. people modifying it. So, I mean, what I basically, as we're walking along, we're seeing the erosion here and it gives you a chance to see the different layers, doesn't it? And for me, what I start to notice is it on a sensory level, so I start to notice the, the colours. And as I start to rub it on my page, I can feel the difference in the soil. So, from the topsoil, which feels quite um, fibrous, I guess, because you've got the plant matter and stuff in it, yep. into what you were telling me about here, which felt a lot more grainy. Yeah, well, you can see visually, you can see straight away there's lots of gravel and um, shattered bits of flint in, in this material here. It's lighter in colour. Um, it does feel grainy, that's because it's got sand in it. Um, whereas this top layer, fibrous is the perfect description for it because that is all the roots from the mm -hmm. grass and the vegetation that's grown along the riverbank. Um, and the reason it's such a dark colour here, it's because it's organic, so the vegetation is decomposing and adding mm -hmm. organic material. But the minute you dig deeper, which luckily we can see here because the rivers eroded the bank, you get into what sometimes is called sort of natural um, in terms of there's no vegetation or there's no organic material within it. And this is essentially what the river is carrying and what the river is laying down. Mm -hmm. It's something we call um, the river is depositing it. So sometimes we refer to this as a deposit. Okay. Um, and a more technical sort of term for what we call this is um, alluvium, which essentially means any inorganic material that has been carried by a water body. So this is the okay. river alluvium. Um, so there you go, there's a little fun science fact for you, word of the day. So for me, when I take this away, like if I go back to the studio or something and I look at this, it's, it's almost like a visual or a sensory prompt that will remind me of our conversation. That sort of helps me learn, essentially. Ah, 
Okay. So I guess that's just the way I learn things. But I've also started to write down other things that are happening around me as well. And the fact that you said it's basically a layer cake, because again, that's like a visual sort of metaphor for what we're walking along, what's under our feet. Yeah, no, it's, it's really challenging visually. So to think about, we're looking at the landscape here, but also what's beneath us. Because in the past, um, and as time goes on, all of these layers, we do often call it a layer cake, um, they build up through time. Mm -hmm. So if we were to dig beneath us now into the ground, we would pull up all of these different layers. And we can see here, we've got the river alluvium um, that was laid down by the river. We've got the organic material. But let's say something happens and a big flood comes in and where we're standing now gets buried with a load of more river alluvium. If I dig down, I can see river alluvium, soil, and then river alluvium. Mm -hmm. and just from looking into the ground and what's beneath me, I can make some interpretation about what happened. So I can say that the river was flowing here and then a vegetated, lovely floodplain landscape developed, but the river changed and the river flooded the landscape. And then I can start to ask questions about what drove that change? Was mm. it climate change? Mm. Did people modify the river in some way? So um, I suppose for me, it's looking about the landscape as we see it now, but it's also, also using your imagination to think what's beneath you and what did all those past landscapes look like and how do they all build up through time? Earlier on, we were looking at different layers, and mm -hmm. I talked about river alluvium, and um, the material sand gravel that is laid down by the river. But we've entered part of the river where the river seems to be flowing directly over the chalk bedrock. So bedrock round here is chalk. Um, as an artist, you, I'm sure you know quite a bit about chalk in terms of using it as a as a medium for your art. But um, something I did see in the chalk here is these big flint nodules. And um, if you live in the south coast, you'll see that around. Um, and rivers often carry huge amounts of flint where they flow through a chalk bedrock landscape. And that is because the river water tends to dissolve the chalk. Mm -hmm. um, so the chalk itself, sometimes it's like toothpaste, you can sort of break it apart in your hands. Um, and it creates a sort of really sludgy clay mud. And so where the river dissolves the chalk, it leaves behind these flint nodules and they can be quite large. Um, and they get tossed around in the river and they shatter. They become gravel on the side of the river. But um, we can just see here, we've got chalk right here. So in terms of the river, it's cutting directly down into the chalk bedrock. And we were saying, because when we were talking before, right at the beginning, we were looking at the different layers. We are talking about how there's a sense of going back through time right from the living breathing growing stuff on the surface down through into the um well hurt down here into the chalk which is millions of years old isn't it in terms of when it was formed anyway yeah millions and mil sort of around 60 million years ago give or take a couple of million years so that's really ancient and chalk is actually made up of lots of um, fossilized organisms that used to live in a tropical ocean and um, you know we're not in a tropical environment now but all of that material fossilised, created the chalk, um, and then the, the landscape that we're looking at is probably only sort of, I don't know, 10,000 years old on top of the chalk. So when you hit bedrock in some ways and you're looking back through time, 
humans were not around when bedrock formed so for me as an archaeologist it's a bit rubbish <laughs> but for you as an artist may, maybe you could get a little bit more from yeah. the actual rock but sort of prehistoric people also in some ways used to make the most of the natural mm. bedrock resource mm. because a lot of the flint that you see within chalk is what was used to make stone tools hand axes and um, so that technology completely changed cultures so again it might not be the river itself but rivers exposing bedrock exposing flint nodules creates material for people to take advantage of and, yeah and yeah. use it as a resource so a strong relationship way back into prehistoric times of people with rivers and the environments that surround mm. them. and obviously people using rivers as a means of transport as well and then accessing those resources as they go exactly um, I said earlier about um, in the past the landscape was a lot more vegetated, it was very forested. Um, we're talking times where you don't have maps, you, you, know, you haven't got your phone. People had no concept of the geography of the landscape. So a river itself creates a pathway or mm. a conduit through that landscape. Um, and I think that's another reason why we see such strong concentrations of archaeology along riverbanks is because people were just attracted to them because if you're standing in a woodland and you can't find your way around you always head for water and then you know which way is upstream and which way is downstream but yeah you can see the water and um, sort of by talking about that flow of the water from upstream to downstream you can kind of see a couple of ripples on the surface here and i think what we can see from these ripples is only a snapshot of what's actually happening beneath the water and so all of those currents that are sort of eroding, picking up material, taking it downstream, um, all of that is happening beneath the surface and we're only just seeing a little sort of glimmer or flicker as the light reflects off the surface. And I'm really interested in that, the, the fact that, yes, we, we call this the river, don't we really, this sort of band of water that runs along, but the fact that you can't sort of draw a line and say that's where the river ends really on a map obviously that it's a blue line isn't it but for instance i walked to try and find the source of the avon from where i live and i walked to where the blue line stops on the map but there isn't you know nothing ends like that in reality does it i mean it doesn't end even when the rain hits the ground it doesn't even end at the clouds there's a whole ongoing system so what we were saying as we we're walking along and doing rubbing of the leaf was that essentially the river runs through the leaf, through the capillaries of the leaf and up through the trunk of the trees in the same way that water flows through our own bodies in the form of blood and so on. So, Yeah, you see that pattern, you can see it in your rubbing, um, that we call it um, a dendritic pattern, um, where you've got lots of other sort of veins or in the sense of rivers, we, it's tributaries feeding into a big river system. Um, and you see that replicated in nature and it's absolutely stunning. When you see it from satellite images um, of some of the large rivers, say for example the Mississippi River, River the, the natural organised pattern that, that nature creates, that you know, we'll see in a leaf, we can see it in a river, we see it in our veins. It's fascinating that that seems to be a, a preferred pattern that nature always wants to recreate no matter what the medium is. So. That, that is quite um, sort of stunning, I think. Mm. And when it comes to art, I think that's perhaps one of those ways that can make, um, if you like, the interconnection of all these, you know, the systemic nature of mm -hmm. the world more accessible to people because it is a very tangible thing to be able to recognise patterns across different organisms and across different landscapes. Yeah, from different sizes, big landscape scale to small, you know, something you can mould on your hand scale. It's quite fascinating.
we sort of headed out from the more rural part of the river to the sort of other side of Salisbury. Now we're entering pretty much Salisbury town centre um, and straight away I mean as we came through we first of all noticed the concrete when we mm -hmm. were underneath the bridges and then you can see along the banks now that there's definitely humans are starting to interfere with the margins of the river itself um, and trying to control that. So that's just going to be can you, what, no, what changes have you noticed? You well notice? I was thinking it was quite interesting down there when we were near the trees that were on the riverbank and when you actually saw, you could actually see the roots at the edge of the riverbank, almost like fingers sort of gripping on to the soil. And then further along there's like, um, I guess, steel sort of caging. And then you've got the other side, you've got the iron and the concrete. So it's almost like when we think back to the start when we were talking about the plants and how they held the soil together, it's like people found other ways to hold the soil back and to stop the river from eroding the banks again. Yeah, it's definitely more of a what they call like hard engineering mm. solutions to managing rivers and the soft engineering is using vegetation and um, yeah and this is more like stick a concrete or a steel wall essentially at the edge of the river and try to control it yeah so it's it stops that changing that you know like when we we're talking earlier about um how you can map the way that a river changes its path over time well this is obviously fixed it's not being allowed to change as such is it yeah and i'm sure if we looked at a map and we looked at the, what the river looked like from above um we'd see a lot more straight lines um, rather than that natural sinuosity and that natural mm. flow that you see usually so we are moving away from the river being able to just do what it needs to do to adjust to climate to rainfall mm. um, and now we're sort of interfering with that and you can even see you can hear the water rushing rushing behind us that's because we humans have gone along and they put a sluice gate in to try and control the flow so we're at a point here where two rivers meet or well it's a confluence of the river so we've got this river that comes behind me and we've got another river that just goes in this direction here so at these points these confluence points um, they can be quite prone to changes mm -hmm. in, in terms of water and flooding so the human response to that is to try to manage it. So they've got a gate just behind us here and at any point they can shut off that gate and stop water flowing in this direction. And maybe that's part of flood management um, to protect any buildings or people that are living along that side of the river and they'll divert the flow in this direction. Hmm. And one thing that I was noticing as we're going along is how it's how the marks on the pages have changed from the more if you like organic shapes and the more um, natural pigments if you like into noticing text noticing straight lines um, architectural features and things like that so when we're talking about how the river is controlled and constrained and thinking about the future where you know there's going to be more fluctuations in terms of rainfall there's going to be more extreme weather events shouldn't we do you think be thinking about giving the river more space within cities rather than developing right up to the edges of the river yeah, it's certainly a case of when you constrict the river and you give it such hard boundaries, if we do have more rainfall, more storms or more sort of flashy floods with high intense rainfall, if you restrict that river then you're, you're almost certainly going to flood your landscape because the river just physically cannot hold all of that water. But normally, sort of, if you look around us here, you can see tarmac, you can see concrete, we're creating a situation where we're essentially putting a cap on the ground and we're not allowing the ground to absorb that extra yeah. water. It's passing the problem on to the somewhere water else. will just run off, it'll either come out of the river and flood the surrounding area and have nowhere to go, or it, it'll flood here, but it can't go into the rivers because the river is restricted. Mm. So we certainly do need to think about given rivers and landscapes, giving them the room to be able to behave as they normally do and let them, you know, the ground is excellent at soaking up water mm. and holding mm. it there. But, we, but here people are, it's being sealed, isn't it? So it hasn't got that opportunity to seep into the surrounding we're putting a cap land. On it and we're, we're, not giving, we're not giving the environment a chance to respond to climate change because we're, we're restricting it in some ways by just building on top. And, and obviously when you do restrict it, that makes the sort of passage of water faster so yeah. you're just passing the problem on to someone else further downstream. Faster, more erosion, we were talking, you know, these um, barriers are put in to protect the river banks but if you've got more water and higher energy flows you've got more erosion so these barriers and concrete 
at some point they're not going to be good enough to hold the mm. water in mm. and then you can get catastrophic sort of failure of not not so much a dam but of the river margins mm. and then the flooding that's associated with that is a lot more extreme so yeah you do when managing a river you need to think ahead in terms of what's the what's the floods going to be like in 10 20 30 years yeah. time and does the system we have in place to manage those floods is that suitable for the future and the, the chances mm. are it's not because we're constantly trying to react with the present day without that foresight to think about what we need to deal with in the future. And when you, I think it's really interesting in terms of Salisbury because Salisbury obviously has the, that heritage of the water meadows and so on. So it has the heritage of, of allowing a river to flood for specific purposes and working with the river. So in, in some ways, again, we can learn from the past and look to ways of managing the river that, yeah. that work with its natural sort of ebb and flow. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, you've got it in one. It's, it's important, like, thinking about the, the past. I always think about prehistoric times, but in Salisbury and the water meadows and sort of human management of the river systems and the water courses, that's been going on since the 17th century. So we've got hundreds of years of history of us interfering with the river as it is um, in a slightly different way, not in with concrete but it's ways of diverting water, flooding fields to save other fields and vice versa. Mm. So there is a long heritage of, of people and management of river systems in Salisbury. Well, when we started off right at the beginning, you were saying about, we were talking about what we wanted to get out of the walk, weren't we? And you were saying how important it was to get out in itself, that that was a key thing. Yeah, definitely. And now we've, we've sort of headed through Salisbury and popped out the other end into sort of a semi-rural spot. And just, I don't know whether it's the time of day or the light, the sun's come out, you can see the changing colours of the leaves. And I just sort of had a realisation where I thought, there's nothing to stop me coming out here every so often in the week you know for a little coffee or something just come out here by myself just have that break from the office and um, switch off sort of sit down and look around you instead of constantly thinking oh, i must do that must do mm. that you know we sometimes move through the landscape without recognizing it because we're always thinking about where we're going or what mm. we've got to do mm. but yeah this i suppose today has given me a bit of an opportunity to take some time and make the most of what we've got around us in our local areas, especially if we go into another version of lockdown. Um, I certainly will be doing different walks than mm. I used to do in mm. the previous lockdown. And I suppose just giving myself that time to sit down, enjoy yeah. the light, enjoy the view, enjoy the river. And that's what this does for me, really, because I mean, it, it is my job to do it, but at the same time, it's, it's my job because it helps me, it benefits me, you know, it helps me to slow down, to notice, to feel connected, to, um, yeah, to, to appreciate what's on your doorstep, really, rather than having to travel somewhere to see something that's special or big or remarkable. It's noticing the, the beauty in the everyday, you know, right where you are. Yeah, definitely.
So how have you found um, sort of taking on board what I brought along today? Um, or making use of what I've brought along today? Yeah, it's challenging because I always saw art as something that artists did, um, not something that maybe I would ever sort of look for or anything that I would do. But I think at the beginning, uh, sort of my sketches or what I noticed started quite basic with me drawing around a stone that I saw on the on the side of the river. But then I suppose as it's gone along, I've got more vegetation. I, I noticed that I was picking up colours. I was gravitating towards colours. We didn't have any colour and pencils here, so the notebook doesn't reflect that. But yeah, just seeing basically what was flowering, you know, mm. the change in leaves, the colours of the leaves. Got a squash blackberry on here. You know, that's art, surely, why not? Um, and then as we got into the city, it completely changed to sort of geometry. All of a sudden, it was straight lines, circles. Um, and I suppose if we didn't make that um, walk through the river from a semi-urban environment into the urban environment, I, I never would have noticed that. We've got some way to go. I think my favourite so far has to be the tree bark rubbing. Mm. Yeah, it's lovely. <laughs> there you can see, quite basic, but you know, for me, that looks like art as opposed to scribble around a stone. But you see, I really like the drawing around the stone. Ah. I mean, what, I, what I'm always saying to people if I work with them is that this this is an opportunity for people to, to sort of notice what they notice, so mm. to not to sort of delve into their inner being, but just to slow down and to pay attention to what calls out to them, if you like. Mm -hmm. And that sort of helps you to reflect, I think, on what's important to you within your local environment. And like you were saying, you're starting to notice that you're drawn to colour and so on. Yeah, I didn't know that before. And in, in itself it might feel like a little thing, but I think it does help you to get to know yourself and to feel more sort of grounded or... There's something about it that I just think works. It's hard to pinpoint exactly why or what, but... Yeah, so you can learn a little bit about yourself. Yeah. And I know quite often for people there is a self-judgment around art that, you know, especially from school <laughs> or wherever, that, oh, I'm not good at art, but this kind of thing is very much about... It's not about trying to be like someone over there, it's about this is for each of us, you know, there's no one else to judge it, this is just recording the experience for yourself, that's how I see it anyway. Yeah, that makes so much more sense. At the beginning I was like, oh, I don't want, I don't want you to mark me down on my artistic skills. <laughs> I don't, I don't not, no. <laughs> I mean, I, yeah, I've been asked to judge things before and I don't like judging things because I think that might not be right for me, but it's right for them. Yeah. And that's what matters really. Mm -hmm. Well said. through Salisbury and um, we're, we're in the water meadows now and you know you can't ask for a better view towards the end of the day um, but thinking about what we've been through and what we've experienced and sort of how to conclude that at the end of the mm -hmm. day I don't know whether you have any thoughts on you know how, how do you feel the day's gone well first of all like we've mentioned before it's not about making something for someone else it doesn't need to make sense to someone else it really is a sort of a collection of experiences and a collection of sensory responses to a place I guess mm -hmm. so it is a mapping to me but it's probably quite different to your kind of mapping because it's a mapping of experiences as you go along as they evolve rather than setting out to have a specific map of somewhere or indeed a map that is going to make sense to anyone else yeah that, that's a very so. good point um, but coming from a scientific background and at least throughout the day I, I've always been thinking about when we ask questions, you know, well, why is that there and why has that happened? And we talked about the sort of complexity of rivers as natural systems and all the feedback loops. And I think something that sort of standing here now and reflecting on the day has made me think that as a scientist, I'm always searching for answers. But through this experience, you know, there doesn't have to be an answer. There's no right, there's no wrong. You don't even really need to think about it in that way. You just need to take a moment and mm. sort of soaking your experiences and just enjoy it and I, th and I think uh, for me a lot of time the answers if they if they if you can call them answers or the learning comes later so at, at this point I can look back and I can see I've had a very rich day and I've really enjoyed the process but I I might not have clear things in my head what I've gained from it but you know next week I might read something or I might talk to something there's something and popping to my head and make a connection with this experience and then it'll all start to make more sense so yeah it's almost about leaving room to 
to not fully understand the importance of what you're doing, but to go with the flow, basically, <laughs> and um, and to just trust in the fact that if you are recording your experiences in ways that are relevant to you and of interest to you, it will be having some benefit. You might just not know what it is at that point. Yeah, and like I like quite like the way you describe this as a as a map. That's a map of your experience. Just hold it up in a bit of a windy. And you know everything that you've seen and, and absorbed today. Whereas for me, traditionally, I make maps. Um, I make maps of the past, of past landscapes, um, and that's something that does require a lot of imagination because I'm using little fragments of evidence that we find buried in the ground all over the place, and I'm supposed to be able to connect all of that evidence to build up a picture of the landscape. Mm -hmm. and it's not so much an art. Of artist's impression of the landscape it's sort of seeing what fossils we find in the ground what does that tell us about the trees that were growing there where were the trees growing and I can begin to populate you know a land say 10,000 years ago 200,000 years ago with there was woodland areas here and mm. I know that because I've got fossilized pollen that tells me that or there was a river here and I know that because I found river alluvium sediments um, so they're the types of maps that I'm used to creating. Mm, mm. Um, and they're not so much traditional like we see today where, where a map is truth. You know, we all have, nowadays, have Google Maps on our phone and we, we write, rely on it so heavily. I'm sort of somewhere between this type of map where you're gathering experiences and, and senses um, and, you know, a hard Google Maps. It's, it's a snapshot into the past mm. and it does require imagination but underpinning that is all the scientific data. Brilliant. I thought I really liked the way that um, her different perspective and her experience as a geologist and working um, with the archaeologists really complemented my experiences as an artist working with different places. So um, we noticed different things, but when we sort of shared what we noticed, they sort of connected and coalesced and really sort of reinforced each other's viewpoints, I thought. So, um, for instance, I might be looking at the, the colours of the different layers in the ground next to the river and she might be talking about how those different layers were formed or how they might change over time. So yeah, it was really good. While I was out with James last week, um, I think I learned a lot from him. First of all, I was quite surprised how for him art is not just the visual. He was very much tuned into the sounds along the river and um, he was tuned into the birds flying overhead. So for him the experience was more than just what he could see it was about what he could feel what he could hear um, and for me i always thought that art was you know the end product you know the physical thing that you see whether it be a painting or a sculpture or something like that i think the main lesson for me was that art is the process not just the end product i love working in collaboration with people yeah I, i'm whether it's working with groups of people, because like for instance, if I'm working with younger children, I, find, I get a lot from how they explore a place. They're, you know, they're, the immediacy of it, the playfulness of it, the way they explore and they're kind of hungry for that experience. Um, or working with someone like Claire, who's got a real depth of experience in a particular area. Um, I like spending time in my studio and having that quiet reflective time, but I, you know, if I was here all the time, it would be too much. You know, I need to go out and connect with people and bounce ideas off of people as well. So while myself and James were out, we both had sketchbooks and we were walking along the river, picking up flowers, fragments of leaves, bits of mud, blackberries. And so we were collecting nature as we walked along the river. 
um, which is quite natural for us as archaeologists because our whole job is about collecting little fragments of, of the past, essentially. Um, and, you know, in terms of what that might look like, we get ourselves some samples of soil or deposits, as I was calling them, when we were walking along the river, and we sieve them and we see what treasure is essentially within those sort of soils. And treasure for archaeology can often mean, I don't know, jewellery or gold coins, weapons. But sometimes treasure can be something as simple as a fragment of a leaf, which is similar to what myself and James were collecting last week. And, you know, we have collections of these from all different archaeological sites and digs around the country. And the material that is within here can tell us a lot about the landscape. So this one, we have fragments of leaves. We can identify what tree they came from so we know what vegetation was growing in this site where the archaeology was found. In other sites, we might find fragments of shell, um, shell that was from a coastal environment, from a beach. So if we find shell in the ground where the archaeology is, we know they were near a beach. Um, we also, if we're very lucky, we can find quite larger items. So in here we have hazelnuts and they are in water because water preserves organic material very well because it doesn't allow oxygen in, which would break down the organic material. So here we have a collection of hazelnuts that we recovered from a site. So there are so many similarities between what James does as an artist collecting information from the landscape around him and we essentially collect the same information but from past landscapes. I mean I really enjoyed talking with Claire about climate and uh, the changes to come if you like because I think it, it is such a key thing for me personally and in my work and um, I don't feel like those conversations are necessarily happening enough between people and not within the kind of areas that I work in. I, some people are, yes, but it tends to stay in a bit of a bubble, I think. You might be called an environmental artist or an ecological artist, and I think, well, no, I'm, I'm an artist who is working in the real world, and it's an issue everywhere. So, so yes, it, it was really good to actually talk with someone whose job is to explore how rivers and sea levels and land changes over time, and to talk together about how that might affect rivers and people living alongside rivers in the future. Um, so as myself and James were walking along the river last week, we just had a couple of days of really heavy rainfall and you could see that the river was starting to flood. The water levels were quite high. Now, when we think about climate change in the future, it would be very difficult to look at a river and that was about to flood and say that that is simply because of climate change. To understand climate, we need to look at the record over a longer period of time, sort of tens of years. So while, you know, it's difficult to observe climate change as humans, um, what we can do is, you know, if we were to walk that river every single day for a year on a year basis, we could observe what was natural for the river and then we would be able to tell if a flood event was unusual or different and it's at that point that we'd be able to say possibly that that was climate change. So when myself and James started out on our walk last week we were in a semi-urban environment that you know we were in lots of fields um, and the river looked like it was in flood but by the time we walked into the centre of Salisbury which was a lot more urban and people had had much more impact on the river and they tried to manage it by putting in concrete walls um, and constricting the flow in an attempt to stop the river from flooding. It was quite interesting to observe that the river looked like it was in flood in a natural environment, but the minute you get into the city centre, you could hardly notice any changes. You wouldn't have known that there'd been heavy rainfall for a few days. I think it's that people's interaction with the river and nature in trying to manage it it's interesting the way we could see that so quickly as you moved from the outskirts of Salisbury into the centre. I felt a lot better after my day, to be honest. Um, because I think for a lot of people at the moment, things are quite tough. 
you know, schools are going back, but we don't know if they're going to stay back. People are going back to work. But there's that sense of, you know, is lockdown going to come again? So, yes, this is my work and it's something I do to pay the bills. But also it's really important to me and my own well-being as well, because it, um, I might not spend so much time alongside a river if I didn't have something to do there. That's one thing. I might walk along the river, but I wouldn't necessarily stop and feel. And I might feel a bit self-conscious, especially doing that in the town. But if I can sit and draw and sit and do rubbing, that's kind of a way in for me to sort of slow down and spend time alongside the river. Thinking about my own personal well-being in times like these, I can definitely say that, you know, at the end of the day on Thursday after the walk, I felt a lot different than I have done usually because I wasn't sitting at a computer all day. I was meeting new people, I was socialising with colleagues, and I was learning something about a new subject. And, you know, that was such a refreshing change. I think I've been more productive since in my job because it sort of broke, broke the monotonous cycle of continuous report writing and sitting at a computer. So I've been more productive. And I think it's quite, quite quickly you get back into that routine and we're sort of a week on now and I need to make sure that I don't forget about the experience and try and remember to get out of the house and to have a break, even if it is just for half an hour a day and just take in the, the landscape that we've got around us. Mm -hmm.